بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم وكان فضله عليه عظيمة والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد الذي أتاه الله عز وجل الحكمة ورفع ذكره وبارك اسمه وأثاب من صلى عليه صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله الأطهار وأصحاب الأبرار ومن اهتدى بهديهم وتسنى بسنتهم حتى تقوم الساعة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This is of course an accompaniment to our class on the Sulam at Swiss which will be released in early summer بإذن الله تعالى and this is meant to sort of help supplement that study and to facilitate an understanding of Islamic logic specifically and the Islamic rational sciences generally. And as you can see here, we put it as a college level study guide. People can understand where we're coming from. So let's quickly talk about what we're going to go through. And before we do that, I think it's important for Sunnis who have sort of this phobia of things that are actually deeply embedded in the Sunni academic canon and tradition that you're going to be challenged to really introspectively examine yourself and maybe realign certain parts of your Sunnism that are unaligned from Sunnism. And I say that not in the sense that you have to agree with those things, but that you become aware that they are part of the broader historical narrative of Sunni Islam at a pedagogic level. If you're not able to do that, I suggest you probably don't want to take this class because it, it, what I'm seeing, especially with uh, le uh, legacy Muslims, not those of us who embraced Islam, but legacy Muslims, is that largely they imagine what Islam is based on who they are, instead of imagining who they are based on what Islam is. And that's very important. Am I imagining Islam based on who I am, or am I am imagining who I am based on what Islam is? And that becomes certainly unnerving and it be, that dissonance can create some uh, you know uncomfortability but as the great Ahmad Didat may Allah bless him said to make people think is to make them hate you as for those who become Muslims the neophytes like myself oftentimes we're running on passion and our passion is driving our imagination of who the ummah is what we mean to the ummah the, the ummah has our back the ummah ain't got your back man if, if we see what's going on in Palestine now at a macro level, the Muslim Ummah at a micro level will be there for you, but at a macro level, you're living in dreamland. And the same thing also applies into the Islamic academic canon, where neophyte Muslims tend to lean towards either irrational um, conservatism or responsible liberalism, religiously, not politically. So it's important that we study the rational sciences because they are key to helping us interpret and understand the historical academic canon within the Sunni community, but also, as we'll talk about, just help us think correctly, man. So let's talk about what we're going to cover. Number one, introduction to Islamic logic. Number two, the nature of Islamic human thinking and its susceptibility to error. Three definitions of logic according to various scholars for the subject matter of logic. Five benefits and applications of logical thinking. Six key terminology in Islamic logic. It's very important for you to know that stuff. Then we'll have some study questions and discussion topics that you can do. If you're a Swiss student, of course, you're going to do it in-house with us to get your, get your degree. Uh, or your Ijazah 8, practice exercises with solutions and nine reference for further reading. This is only going to be about seven to eight lessons here. This is the site map for those seven to eight lessons. Then we'll do more and more and more and more. Okay, so this is not the whole course that you're looking at. Let's talk about the introduction to Islamic logic. Islamic lo logic is called ilmu mantiq. Mantiq, of course, from meaning to, to, to communicate, is a discipline that has been integral to the Islamic intellectual tradition for centuries. It represents the Muslim engagement with and development of Aristotelian logical tradition, which was translated into Arabic during the early Abbasi period from the 8th to 9th century as part of the translation movement centered in Baghdad. I would argue that it wasn't only the Muslims, Arab Muslims that were involved in this engagement, but even the Arab Christians, as well as others. But people, Arabic speakers, which was led by Muslims because the state was largely a Muslim state. 
And what you should know is even up until this period of time, even though the Muslims are running these countries politically, there's still a minority in many of these places. And that's powerful when you think about it. Because nowadays we talk about numbers and numbers and numbers and numbers. Maybe it's about effort, bravery, drive, ingenuity, being inspired. Inspiration, as one of my teachers said, an inspired student is equal to one regular student. Logic serves as a methodological tool that protects the mind from error, just like grammar protects your pen and tongue from mistakes. In its pursuit, what is logic looking for? It's pursuit of knowledge. We talked about that in Usul of Fiqh and Truth. It provides a foundation for rational thinking, argumentation, and the evaluation of evidence across all fields and all fields of Islamic knowledge. I'll push it that far. And it impacts us at a day-to-day -day level, even if we may not be aware of it. There's a historical context here. We give you five periods because this is an introductory course, of course. If we look at this in a deeper level, there's going to be more than that. So, for example, number one, the translation period, the 8th and ninth centuries. Well, I would argue that before the translation period, you have the exposure period. There were people who engaged these texts, like Hunayn ibn Ishaq, who was you know, a Christian, uh, and others, they say that even in the Risala of Sayyidina Imam al-Shafi, rahimahullah, that there are some small uh, uh, glimpses of him being familiar with logical, legal constructions. Although he's such a genius, he does his own thing. Rahimullah. And that's very important because Dr. Mahmoud Abdurrahman Abdul Mun'im, who has a great book on Mantiq, one of our teachers from the Azhar, was the former dean of Usul al Fiqh uh, at Azhar. He said, you know, the idea that Muslim scholars just made taqlid of Aristotle and and just blindly followed is a slander, but in fact what we have is a, a tathir of mantiq yunani, a purification of Greek logic, and brought into Islamic sharia compliance. Okay, But there's this early period of exposure before translation, before it went viral. Some people were brilliant enough that they spoke other languages and they engaged other texts. And then around the 8th and 9th century it becomes translated, and, you know, starts to lead, if you will, the snowball starts to take off. So Aristotle's works were translated into Arabic, not primarily, but there was a significant number of Syriac Christians who contributed to the effort making Greek logical ideas acceptable to everybody. Even now, as we know, in the West, the handoff comes from the Muslim world to the West too early reception and criticism, so from 9th to 10th century is where you're going to start to see the sifting happening. Not at an individual level, but now schools are going to look at logic and begin to sift it and shareize it, if you will, with some theologians rejecting it as a foreign import and others who will become the majority incorpor incorporating it into Islamic thought. And notable figures from this period are Farabi, of course, who was known as the second teacher. Uh, after Aristotle by some people, but most of us, we ain't calling Aristotle the first teacher. Mu'alim al Three, integration and development from the 11th to 13th centuries. Prominent scholars like Ibn Sina, who we're going to be talking about quite a bit, and Al-Ghazali integrated logic into Islamic intellectual frameworks. But before them is Imam al-Haramain, Imam al-Baqilani. There are others who do this before them. Al-Ghazali is Mi'yar al-Ilm, the standard of knowledge, was particularly important in legitimizing the study of logic amongst religious scholars. And one of the things that Al-Ghazali does is he finds this unique balance between what is the relationship between the rational sciences and, of course, the Sharia. He's not the only one, but he dedicates a lot of time to that. Great example that I heard from a teacher is like, it's like the light and the sun. Without the sun, you have no light. Without the light, you have no sun. So you have to have the intellect and you have to have the sharia. One without the other is a problem. People won't be able to function. Allah says, لَعَلَكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ So you can use your mind. In the fourth sort of, you know, stage, and this five-stage development, this is from the 13th to 15th centuries after Hijri, guys, uh, sorry, CE, logic became a standard component of the Islamic education system with scholars like At-Tulsi and At-Taftazani who wrote extremely influential books. 
I mean, they're studied till this day. So what you find now in the fourth is this jil at tadween where it becomes standardized and now taught. So why is that important? It's a way to respond to people to say, well, you know, these people just adopted Greek logic and ran with it. No, we see these different periods. And when these periods, you have to think about theologians, uh, specifically as well as scholars of law and others, are concerned about what this science represents and means. And so you have some who reject it, who are respected scholars, like Imam Siyuti, Imam Anawi, Rahimahullah. You have others who say that you have to study it, like Abu Hamad al-Ghazari in some quotes. Then you have the majority who say, listen, for specialists or people who have a strong grasp of Quran and Sunnah, and they are well-educated, um, they should study this. And now we have a, another group of people who say, listen, the, the Islamic canon academically is largely written in this system. So if you're going to be involved in religious vocation or religious scholarship, you need to understand how to read it correctly. I've seen many times, I saw this in, in my days of studying, especially when people were trying to read Isnawi's explanation of the Minhaj of Al-Baydawi, Arabs would read that writing and not understand what was being communicated. Because it wasn't written just in Arabic, it was written within a set of logical sort of frames and, and principles. So the fourth opinion is that if you're going to be involved in a religious vocation, if you're going to be someone who's teaching people, even if you agree with it or not, you need to be familiar with it because so much is written in this style and presented in this way. Finally, the educational tradition, 16th century and onward, a little bit, that's a little bit late to be honest with you. It happens before that logic becomes embedded in the Islamic educational curricula. Till now in the Azhar High School, they still teach this text, a sulam al uh, fi ilm mantaq. And so, Sulam Munawarak fi ilm mantaq, we studied it, I think, multiple times by the scholar Abdurrahman al Akhdari, who died around 1546, right? What's its significance in Islamic scholarship? Logic holds a vital position in the Islamic scholarly tradition for several reasons. It serves as a methodological foundation for other Islamic sciences, specifically Ilm Kalam and jurisprudence, and falsafa, philosophy, Islamic philosophy. I know when you use the word ilm al-kalam, people who hold on to the word aqidah get really upset, and people who hold on to the word aqidah, people who hold ilm al-kalam get upset. Listen, both of those are sciences within the science of ilahiyat. And both of them have their place, and both of them have their importance. Instead of seeing things as being divergent, try to see them as being perhaps uh, as cont elements that can help contribute to not only your growth, but the needs of the world. It provides tools for interpreting religious text, evaluating the strength of arguments, and resolving apparent contradictions. Now you can see why it's important in Usul al-Fiqh, and now you can see why Imam al-Haramain, as I shared on those clips on, on introduction to Usul, priming the primer, why they're talking about like certainty and knowledge and delusion and things like that. It establishes a common intellectual framework that facilitated dialogue between different Islamic schools of thought and between Islamic scholars and those of other traditions. It creates an academic environment. It enables a systematic defense of Islamic doctrine against philosophical challenges. And that is true. And that is true until this day. You know, every I believe every year in, in Harvard, you have a group of Muslim scholars, uh, may Allah protect us from Harvard, but who gather and talk about what are the, the, the issues of today that, for example, Ilm al-Kalam can address. Ibn Sina, he says, the science of logic is the tool by which correct and incorrect thinking are distinguished. Whoever does not know logic cannot be confident in any science. That's his opinion. Al-Ghazali has a very similar sort of opinion. Not everybody agrees with that, of course. But hyperbole aside, Ibn Sina was Ibn Sina. This study guide will explore the foundations of Islamic logic, beginning with an examination of human thinking. So we're going to start there next time. Explore various definitions of logic provided by Muslim scholars up until this current period, as well as some definitions by non-Muslims. Investigating the subject matter of logic and highlighting its benefits and applications in both classical and contemporary contexts. We have another class on the history of Ilm al-Kalam where we highlight the dangers of untethered logic uh, as it played out historically and even uh, till now. Inshallah, next time we're going to talk about the nature of human thinking. Barakallahu feekum, wa jazakum khairan, wa sallallahu wa sallam, 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 wa sallam